and thank you all for coming to the Marysville Tulalip Chamber of Commerce Business Before Hours via Zoom. So today we've got a couple of great presentations for you. One will be the State of the Chamber address and the other will be via Mayor Nearing, uh, the State of the City address. So uh, a couple of announcements before we get started. The second round of PPP loans are available through your local banks. More information on that on our website and in our February 5th newsletter. Um, if you have any questions during this meeting, please feel free to type in the chat or raise your hand. See, we've got quite a few good mornings in there. This is being recorded uh, to be published on the Chamber's YouTube channel, so just a heads up on that. Also, uh, we've got our supportlocal.com website coming up. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that in the presentation, but um, that's coming in February. So keep an eye out for that in your newsletter. Um, and then since we've shortened the meeting to an hour rather than an hour and a half, a half when we were meeting in person, um, we aren't able to do roundtable networking the same. So if you would be so kind as to type your contact information into the chat box, so your name, business name, and contact info, then what I'll do is after the meeting is over, I'll send out the chat to all the attendees. And it's a, basically a digital business card swap. So that way you guys are still getting a little bit of connection while we're doing it via Zoom. So let's go ahead and jump right into the presentation. Fabulous. All look well and thumbs up. Good. Okay, perfect. Thank you guys. So first of all, to those of you that I haven't met yet, my name is Jessica Stickles and I'm the president and CEO of the Marysville Tulalip Chamber for about six years now. Um, a couple other hats that I wear that I may have met you in those spheres is my uh, role on the Arlington City Council, also on several boards throughout the community, the Washington State University Everett Campus Board, the Association of Washington Business Institute Board, the Leadership Snohomish County Executive Team, and the North County Economic and Workforce Recovery Task Force. They have nice long names. So I wanted to show you guys the mission statement that our board created to enhance exposure, advocate, and support development for business success. Also, our vision statement to be the leading voice and resource for business in Marysville and Tulalip. And lastly, our values, which show exposure, advocacy, and development. And this is how we do, how we meet those values. This is our team here at the chamber, myself and our office manager, and then Dave, who is still an employee here. He's just on temporary furlough. This is our executive board of directors. Um, the election will actually be complete next month. Normally we do it at the end of the year. However, um, there's been a lot of changes in the community and leadership and in roles at different organizations. So we were kind of waiting for things to settle down a little bit and now we'll finish our elections. We do have seven executive committee members with a one year term and they represent all areas of the community, including small and big business, nonprofits and government. Our board of directors has eight seats and they all serve a two-year term. We do have two openings coming up for this. So if you have been interested in serving on our board um, now or in the future, let me know. And then our fabulous ex officios. So we've got eight seats on our ex officio board and each of these com uh, community areas are covered. So Navy, city, nonprofits, tribe, the Spanish community, labor, professional development and faith. And so at each meeting, at each monthly board meeting, each of these areas reports on what's going on in the community. So we're able to stay up to date and well-connected. A little bit about our membership. Uh, we ended 2020 with 200 businesses as members, which is actually a 14% drop from last year. And this is the first year we've had a reduction in membership since I've been here. It does represent over 21,000 employees, 
And overall, uh, about 30% of our membership is outside of the Marysville and Tulalip area. So last year we started the Silver Club. So I wanna make sure I highlight these awesome members, 17 businesses that have been loyal chamber members for over 25 years. The next level is Gold Club at 50 years, but uh, each year we'll be adding to this exclusive list as longevity adds up. Uh, at the end of 2019, we sent out a chamber membership survey. So I thought it was really interesting to, to kind of go over that with what's going on today. So the overall reason or results that stood out were that the largest reason they were they renewed their membership was due to the connections made. Plans on growth showed that 36% of our members were planning to add new employees in 2020. The highest rated benefits for chamber members were to be kept informed by the latest news and business issues, as well as connecting to other businesses through referrals. And then the largest issue affecting members at the end of 2019 was finding and hiring reliable qualified workers. And of course, a new survey will be going out this year so that we can get an update from everybody. So our chamber committees are still going strong. Um, we've got five that are monthly, and then we've got a couple ad hoc throughout the year. The events committee focuses on the three annual events a year, and the chairman right now is Michelle Hernandez. Our membership committee focuses on strategizing for planning for the growth of the future, and the membership committee chair right now is Gloria Hiroshima. We also have our government affairs committee, which puts together our candidates forum and our legislative agenda. And right now our chair is Peter Rudolph. Our emissary committee is the one that focuses on all the fun themes for our B2B events and our mega mixers. And they are part of our outreach and they're probably who have called you to check on you over the past couple months. And the chairman of that committee is Becky Mulholland. And lastly, our newest committee is our Military Affairs Committee, where we are supporting veterans and connecting them to employment and um, opportunities in the community. Um, the chair of the Military Affairs Committee is R.D. Burley, who is the past commander of Everett Station, Everett Naval Station. So for, show this. for 2020, our normal events were canceled, so we got creative and made some new events. So this was one of the ones we created, the community scavenger hunt, where we partnered with Outback Steakhouse, made it so everyone who signed up for this got a list of things to find in the community, take a picture of, and then turn it in. And the people who have found the most items in the community won prizes. And then everybody got an amazing dinner from the Outback Steakhouse once it was over. So this was just some of the participants who we gathered together. And you can kind of tell the timing of this because only myself and the staff were wearing masks. So it kind of shows you timeline. Chamber uh, Government Affairs Committee put together the candidates forum. And then this year we put it all on YouTube. Um, so it was watched throughout the election time and um, we were able to ask the candidates some fabulous questions and um, get the information out there for everybody still. We also created the Marysville Toledo restaurant page so that the community could have an idea of what's going on with takeout and delivery since it's changing so often. This was an idea that we borrowed from another community and it just took off. And so right now we've got over 2000 members on it and it's totally self-sufficient. Everybody lets everybody else join the businesses and restaurants post on there daily about different specials and, and deals going on. So I recommend you check this uh, frequently because new things are added. Um, and another thing we did was we helped the county with the PPE distribution to our businesses. So we had about 100 kits to help distribute. And other COVID things we did to help were posting information on our website as it changed out into the newsletters with the updated restrictions and regulations, as well as an updated list of what businesses were open and closed at the beginning. So coming up for this year, 
This is uh, a little bit about the shop Marysville Tulalip website. So one thing we noticed during all of this is that there are a lot of small businesses that are not online. They possibly don't have the capacity or the knowledge of the online marketplace. You know, they know their business right in front of you. So we wanted to try to help them. And so this uh, site had um, it's set up already so that all we have to do is have them fill out this interest form that you see at the bottom of the screen. And then it auto populates into the website and then we just add products. It's a very simple to use. And because we were able to get grants from the city of Marysville and the Snohomish County CARES Act, this is no cost to any of the businesses. Our goal is to have 100 businesses on within the next three months. Um, and then we'll be able to service them the rest of the year. With this comes um, introduction and training to taking product photos. So we have a photographer that's going to be working with the businesses saying, show me some of your best selling products and I'll show you how to set it up so that you can take a photo with your phone that looks nice. Here's the backdrop, here's the lighting. Then we'll have a social media uh, expert come in and talk to them and help them template how they can post their ads and really work with them to help grow. So everybody that signs up for this isn't only going to be able to have products online, but they're also going to get some individual one-on-one -on -one training with some experts. And all of this is no cost. The website then, once they get these products up, when you go to click on an item that you want to purchase, it takes you to their website. So it's e-commerce through them. The funds go directly to them. We're not a middleman. We're just helping host the site and get them online. So this year, we are hoping that our events can all come back, right? As of right now, we're planning for August. And so we are still planning to have the Brewfest, the Carnival, the networking, and the Mega Mixer. And we'll just keep uh, plugging away until we know further. As far as communication goes, we've added a couple avenues so that we can reach out and be able to take information in. Um, we still have our bi-weekly newsletter, our website's kept up to date, as well as having that interest form right on the homepage. Our YouTube channel has been filling up as we've been hosting these types of events. And then Facebook is always a good source for information. Lastly, uh, I want to wrap up just by saying thank you all for your support through this time. We've gotten so many calls on uh, how that you guys can help other businesses and at, still asking to how they can volunteer. And so I just want to do a personal thank you to everyone who is still plugged into the community and trying to help any way that you can. You are noticed and appreciated. So now, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Mayor John Nearing to do his presentation. I'm Mayor John Nearing, and it's really a pleasure to have you join us for this virtual state of the city. You know, certainly the year that we all anticipated at this time last year turned out a lot different. Uh, a year ago on January 20th of 2020, the first U.S. COVID patient was admitted to Providence Hospital in Everett. And that started a 2020 marked by a worldwide pandemic, which as you well know, created ripple effects on not just public health, but also on our economy, our businesses, uh, family and individual financial situations, our social networks, and personal ways of adjusting and coping. Our way of life has dramatically changed. Um, you know, I'm proud of the way the city leaders and employees really stepped up and pivoted as needed and met the many challenges we faced to deliver high quality services and maintain all the essential services of your local city government. This past year we know has been so very difficult for many of our residents and our businesses. And we are committed to continuing to do whatever we can to help everyone get through this most difficult of times. We'll talk a lot more about COVID and our COVID response later on in this presentation. But right now, let's uh, kind of dive into some other things. I want to start by taking a quick look at some stats here. Uh, population and some of the other things. We always like to start out by showing that. It gives you an idea of where we're at here in the city. And following that, we'll go ahead and move now and take a look at some of the other operations of city government, starting with finance. 
So Marysville operates under a two-year budget, which I think we've talked about in the past. So currently that is a $396 million two-year budget that was approved by the city council towards the end of last year. This chart gives you a look at where the city's general fund money came from in 2020. As a public agency, our finance department is, of course, ever mindful of good financial stewardship. We work hard on that every single day and every single year. We recognize that these are your hard-earned tax dollars. We all pay them as well, myself and the city council. And so we're proud to have earned 13 consecutive clean financial audits. And I want you to know that our general approach uh, financially is conservative. And that set us up well over the many years compared with other cities and our financial situation is currently sound. Next, I want to take a look at some highlights by departments and by various programs. Here in Marysville, the majority of the city's general fund goes towards law, safety, and justice programs. And that's not unlike other local governments. It's very similar everywhere throughout the county and throughout the country, really. Targeted policing strategy continues to make a real dent in crime in our community. I know public safety is the top priority of our citizens and our businesses. I want you to know that our strategies are paying off. Overall crime levels are 21% below the 2019 rate and as much as 48% below what we saw six years ago in 2014 when we really began to aggressively combat some of the crimes that were plaguing our community at that time. As of November 2020, the Marysville Police handled over 63,000 calls for service. That's a remarkable number and is a real testament to their dedication and work. In 2020, we also welcomed, as many of you probably heard, a new police chief, Eric Scarpin. And, you know, we also hired nine new police officers, two new custody officers, a new code enforcement officers and officer, and one new records unit specialist. So we continue to invest in our police department and in the public safety of this community. So several long-serving employees uh, are retiring this month, creating additional vacancies. And so we're excited to hire a second evidence and property technician for our police department in 2021. And this year we'll also see a new assistant chief chosen for the department as uh, assistant chief Jeff Goldman enters his retirement. So both those hiring processes are underway. We're excited about them. We're excited about the work done in our police department. If you see an officer out on the street, uh, give them a thank you. They work really hard every single day to keep this community safe. It's not an easy time uh, to be in, in, the poli in police work. And uh, I'm really proud of the work done by our department. Code enforcement is another area that comes underneath our police department, it works on a wide range of public nuisance issues. These include boarding up of vacant homes that can attract squatters, impounding vehicles parked in the right of way, and things of that nature. In 2020, this team was really busy, opened up 273 new cases and closed 270 cases. And now we move to our very popular canine unit, our canine officers, Copper and Steel, and their human partners had 166 cases in 2020. Of those, they joined 86 patrol cases where they successfully tracked suspects on 62% of them, a remarkable rate. This canine team was involved in 80 narcotics cases where they recovered over six pounds of meth over four pounds of heroin, uh, almost two grams of cocaine, 197 fentanyl pills, 19 firearms, and almost $200,000 in illegally obtained cash. I think many of you have probably seen maybe on our national night out or other times gotten to witness copper and steel in action when our officers have, have shown that. And we really appreciate the community support uh, for our canine program that's come throughout the years and they do remarkable work. Another area of our police department that I'm particularly proud of and I think it's been a real success story. This is our state-renowned embedded social worker team. This program started in 2018. It pairs a Marysville Police Department officer with a social worker. And these folks go out and outreach into the community to form relationships and help those that are addicted to various substances, drugs or, or other things. Also those dealing with mental health issues. And they offer them treatment or other social services that get at the root of the problem of what they're dealing with, to try and get them off the streets, get those things taken care of, get some temporary housing, get some job training, and an ability to reconnect with the life that maybe some of them once had, hopefully job opportunities and things like that. These are things that drive at the root of the problem that we need to help these people. Many of the people that we see wandering the streets do have an addiction problem or a mental health problem or both. And so Officer Buell and social worker Rochelle Long have been out with this team. They do a phenomenal job. They work really hard every single day to build relationships with these clients that they meet on the street. 
they'll go up into our jail and meet with people. So since this program started, there's some really amazing stats. They've completed 322 assessments. They've gotten 71 people in for a detox, 30 mental health evaluations. They've enrolled 160 people in inpatient treatment. And that's really critical. That's 160 people off our streets into a treatment program. 93 of those people have graduated. So we make no bones about it. Not everybody we get off the streets into treatment makes it all the way through. But think about how remarkable it is that 93 people that used to be out on our streets, in the woods, wherever, have graduated treatment program and are hopefully at some stage of a second crack at life. I could tell you personal stories of people that have sent me notes, have joined my virtual coffee clutches and typed things in that just basically say, thank you Marysville for this program and our tough love approach that really forced me to get into treatment and get this taken care of. People that otherwise would still be out there would maybe be dead or who knows where are now reunited with their families, uh, working and productive members of society. The reason this program is so successful is one, primarily the, the great work of the embedded social worker team, but it's also the philosophy that we don't allow you to just continue to live that lifestyle in Marysville. So they'll say, hey, look, you know, we've got something we can charge you with right here, or trespassing or whatever. You know, we're offering you a, a better choice, but you can't say no to that and have no ramifications. So either you take the very generous offer of treatment and a second crack at life, or we will charge you for these crimes. You know, you don't get to just continue to break into stores and cars and live out on private property or wherever you're living. And so that's why the program's successful. It just goes to show that following through on that tough love approach pays off. So 93 graduated from treatment and uh, housing secured, 192 people we've secured uh, at least temporary housing for. That's another remarkable number from this team. 2,868 total encounters they've had and they've had 472 total new clients. So really proud of this program, proud of the work done by our police department in here and particularly our embedded social worker program. It's a real team effort and they are doing phenomenal. So in 2021, we will be looking at new options to expand this. Those stats should tell you that uh, with one social worker and one officer, they're really running hard and uh, we don't want people to fall through the cracks. And so we're going to be looking at ways to expand this program. There's some things we can do to bring some more money back in house on this and, and, and reinvest it in, in just Marysville solutions. Um, Chief Scarpin is also working uh, on a mental health uh, uh, grant partnership with Arlington and Lake Stevens where we can add a couple of uh, shared mental health uh, professionals to help us in these areas and so uh, look forward to 2021 uh, working with these folks and announcing to the community some new and expanded ways we can continue to make this program cutting edge and successful. So with public safety I want to move on to the fire district which is actually the regional fire authority so the fire district is not a direct department of the city it's a separate regional fire authority with a separate governing board and, a, uh, and then the, the chief, Martin McFalls, who they employ there uh, to lead the district on a day-to-day -day basis. But it is a critical part of the function of public safety in our community. So I always like to include the key points and highlights from them in the state of the city as well. Chief McFalls likes to say they're looking back while they're moving forward. I think that's a, a great way to put it. And the Marysville Fire District formed partnerships really in the face of COVID regional partnerships and others to obtain vital uh, personal protective equipment that was really critical to our emergency personnel continuing to function in a safe manner throughout the pandemic in 2020. So those partnerships were critical. It also helped keep crews and our residents safer and allowed them to continue to deliver the exceptional service to our residents and businesses that they deserve and that uh, they are proud to, to perform. These services included outside of the normal day-to-day -day operations uh, also our annual September 11th ceremony. So I'm pleased that we did not call that off due to COVID. We just uh, put on a virtual event that the community to, could observe. It actually probably allowed more people to participate because they could log on from their home or their place of work as opposed to, to necessarily having to come down there. Other highlights from, uh, from our fire team, they completed their first ever community driven strategic plan. It was their first year as a regional fire authority. Um, the voters approved this in 2019, so it was a great time to put this strategic plan together. They received also a $470,000 regional federal grant uh, for life-saving equipment, 
That was huge. They equipped all staff vehicles with AEDs, which was another big thing. They added a fire inspector and a training captain, added an urban search and rescue trailer with tools to respond to these kind of emergencies. And so that was a big thing as well for our fire team. So really proud as, as we are of our police officers, of these folks. Great work by them, great plans ahead for 2021. So moving on from public safety to uh, another really critical area of a growing and vibrant community, and that's the infrastructure of the community and some of the highlights there. We'll start with areas we're growing business-wise. Here's some new businesses that have joined our community in 2020 and then a few others that are coming in 2021. We did continue to attract businesses, both large and small, last year. Sadly, the economic impacts of both the airline industry and of the COVID pandemic response are playing out in Marysville, just as they are throughout the region and country. So uh, there was some limits to the growth that we had this year in our businesses uh, that were relocating here or those that were starting here. But we are grateful for so many businesses that choose to locate here in a vibrant part of our community. As we move into 2021, I do want to let you know we, we will be working on a downtown master plan update. You know, our downtown is seeing some really nice revitalization and cleaning up here over the last several years. We'll be expanding the size of this downtown master plan area, addressing waterfront redevelopment now that a lot of the cleanup has been done on the waterfront. We can take a look at maybe what happens over the next five years or so and, and even beyond that looking at transit, pedestrian, and bicycle improvements, and reviewing permitting housing types and location and things of that nature. So those things will be happening in, on, a, on a planning level here in 2021. Looking back on 2020, uh, we were really excited to finally open the First Street Bypass. Hopefully you've had a chance to drive that. It was completed on time and within budget. This is a quarter mile new roadway that extends First Street and connects Alder to 47th Avenue. Construction cost was 13 million. The total project cost 22 million. This supports the new traffic flows that'll come with the completion of the new interchange off of I-5 onto Highway 529. That design build project begins in 2022 and is expected to be completed in 2023. This is state funded uh, almost entirely, that new interchange. And the first street bypass was critical to that so that when when that traffic flow begins to come off I-5 towards the end of 2023, everything doesn't merge at 4th and State with uh, exit 199 still available. So we, we created a way to get people straight up into the ever-growing Sunnyside and Eastside Foothill neighborhoods. Plus we have a lot of through traffic that goes on up towards Granite Falls and Arlington, Lake Stevens or other cities. So critical infrastructure improvements that will help for many, many years to come. And we're excited about this new interchange too that obviously will in addition to helping all the traffic flow, will create a way in and out of the city around the trains. Uh, State Avenue, you're probably witnessing even right now, State Avenue 100 to 104th was begun in uh, 2020, and we'll, uh, we're, we're pleased with this. The last segment of State Avenue that is not five lanes is, is that 100 to 116th. And so uh, this is the last portion to be improved. The most difficult and expensive section of that is the new bridge where the roadway crosses Quilcita Creek. In 2018, the city was awarded, thankfully, a $6.2 million state grant to help fund this project. And uh, this again, as I pause for a moment, just highlights, we get s millions and millions and millions of grant dollars uh, through hard work of our em employees and all of us uh, lobbying for these grants that help fund these local infrastructure projects and bring some of this money back from Washington, D.C. and Olympia into your community. And this is tax dollars that you pay uh, we just work to get a, as much of it back and invested in our community as possible. So last year we made uh, significant construction um, uh, improvements in that phase from 100 to 104th. That's ongoing. Uh, it's about halfway complete now, including the uh, construction of the new bridge and the retaining walls, et cetera, and the private utilities, which will be uh, affected with that. And so we look to uh, begin completion of that here and um, probably uh, looking at, at the end of this year, the beginning of 2022, before the, uh, the project will be complete. We're excited about the, the safety improvements, the enhanced environmental protection that it offers, and it also uh, expands the roadway. And we did receive already a $4 million grant to advance the construction on 104th to 116th. So that's the second phase of this um, project. 
And so we intend to complete final design of that and begin some property acquisition and construction will be following in 2022. Another important piece is, is not just building new roadways like the First Street Bypass and the new interchange at 529 and this project I just previously talked about. We wanna preserve what we have, that's critical. And so we have an ongoing pavement preservation program. This is funded by uh, your voter approved transportation benefit district, which was voted in several years ago. We dedicate a good chunk of this money towards overlays and pavement repair, sidewalk ramp replacement to meet ADA standards utility adjustments, channelization, and much more. So as you can see here, there's a project list that was completed in 2020, and then some of the projects planned for 2021. That $2.5 million figure is the combined cost for 2020 and 2021 projects. At 83rd and Soper, we had a project that was located actually in Lake Stevens, but was completed by Marysville to address the traffic impacts from development within our community. So we worked this out with Lay Stevens. Most of the work was finished in May and June and an intersection closure that we had there that was approved by both cities did save us about $50,000. So we're pleased with trying to find efficiencies like that. So there's other traffic safety improvements coming here this year. Some of the highlights for 2021, uh, the State Avenue Safety Improvement Project Program that we have are uh, fully funded by a lot of times by federal highway safety improvement grants. And so we're really pleased to continue to bring that kind of money in, as I mentioned earlier. There's some other things coming in, in 2021 that I wanna highlight, and these are the low impact development facilities. What this is, is a bioretention cells and permeable pavers along Cedar Avenue. We'll be putting in from 1st to 4th Street and along 2nd Street from Columbia Avenue to 47th. These additional roadway improvements are really, really similar to the previously constructed ones that we had at 3rd uh, and at 1st Street, the ones that are shown in the um, graphic here. The goal is to improve uh, water quality for the water that flows into the EB Slough, treating the storm water and making it cleaner, and also creating a more aesthetically pleasing roadway and even one that's uh, more conducive to the type of travel and environment that the community wants in those areas. So. The estimated project cost for these is 3.7 million. Again, uh, grants are going to pay, grants from the Department of Ecology at the state are going to pay for about two thirds of that. So we expect to build the Cedar Avenue improvements this spring and summer and Second Street probably in 2022. Um, we have some stormwater treatment projects that I wanted to highlight. These improve the water quality into EB Slough by installing a lift station that will convey stormwater runoff to media filter basins at the Geddes Marina property. And that's critical. That water was really contaminated over the years with the type of industry that was down there. This facility will remove solids, uh, oil, copper, zinc, phosphorus, and other things from the stormwater before they discharge into EB. Scheduled to start in 2021 and will be completed in 2022. Project funding again here was 75% uh, funded through a state ecology grant and 25% from the city of Marysville. You know, we've also submitted a proposal for additional grant funds to increase the capacity of the uh, facility to treat over 460 acres, um, the full entire downtown uh, area basin. So that's exciting as well. What about our wastewater treatment plant? Wanted to give you a few updates there. These aren't necessarily glamorous things, but these are kind of the nuts and bolts of uh, government, making sure that the, that the things you depend on every single day continue to function at a high level. So we did have the need for some headworks improvements this year, about $3.9 million worth that began in the spring of 2019 and was completed at the end of December of 2020. In addition to that, we also did our biosolids removal. This happens periodically. I actually was out there a few times to, to view this. This is not a cheap thing to do, but it's necessary to keep your wastewater treatment plant functioning. It was a $9.9 .9 million project completed in September of this past year, 2020. And uh, amazingly, we removed 17.7 dry tons of biosolids from the wastewater treatment plant lagoons to improve their function and their storage capacity. Just kind of walk, wanted to walk you through a few of the nuts and bolts of that. And so moving from that into some of the more quality of life issues, we like to talk about live, work, and play in Marysville. These are things that we do to try and enhance the quality of life for our residents and for those who visit. Of course, COVID threw a wrench in a lot of our really popular activities that we were disappointed not to be able to put on this year. Even so though, city staff um, came up with some real creative ways to reimagine some of the activities that we do 
and to create new ways to engage with the public even during the pandemic year. Um, we continued also, uh, importantly, uh, hopefully you've noticed, to make good progress on improving and expanding our parks and trails in the city even throughout 2020. One of the great new uh, featured attractions is Cedar Field. If you're like me and had kids that played Little League Baseball or maybe you coached Little League Baseball in the past, you had the pleasure of doing it at Cedar Field, which is just a, an icon in our community. So we vastly improved this. This was a long time coming. It was a goal of mine, I know, for a long time. And, and I know the Little League community and the, the local sports community really has wanted this for a long time. This project included construction of a synthetic baseball field, plain surface, the installation of LED lighting. It's a really beautiful renovation. If you haven't had a chance to drive by, please do so and check it out. It'll greatly extend the playing season for our youth when you have turf to play on instead of a muddy, wet field. You can play well into the rainy season. The new lighting system will cut energy consumption by up to 80%. And with the virtual elimination also too of that glare that, and the wasteful light that spills into surrounding areas with some of the older lights. It was jointly funded by the State Recreation and Conservation Office, Snohomish County Government, Marysville Little League, and the City of Marysville all pitched in. Final amount was $887,000. Uh, new construction was completed back in June. And unfortunately, nobody's gotten to play on it yet. We're really excited to see Little League games start there just as soon as possible and get those uh, cedar burgers cooked up and get everything going again. Olympic View Park is another really exciting addition to our community that will come here in 2021. This is a new park in the Sunnyside area that features plazas overlooking the Kulud Estuary, the Ibislu and the Olympic Peninsula Mount Range. It will include a restroom, a picnic shelter, ADA accessible, trail that will connect the park to the existing EV waterfront park. So this is a, a really neat addition to our park inventory. The work is going on right now and uh, we're expecting to complete it mid to late February. The total project cost was $847,000. Importantly, we got a state grant that covered 500,000 of that 847,000. So once again, uh, you know, leveraging your tax dollars to get to get money in from the state uh, to help complete this. Well, I don't know how many people out there use the Bayview Trail. I use it an awful lot. I, I live close to it, so I'm out on it walking and jogging um, really almost daily, or at least several times a week. But one thing I'm really excited about, and I've had so many people ask about this, is the possibility of connecting that to the Centennial Trail. So we've been working on that for a few years, and uh, this is the year that uh, it'll happen. This uh, one and one half mile addition to the existing Bayview Trail will provide a vital link for pedestrians and bike riders and joggers and everybody to the fastest growing area in Marysville. So when complete, it'll connect the Bayview Trail to the Centennial Trail. Right now to get to Centennial, you have to cross Highway 9. We've been involved in this design and, and kind of working on this for about two and a half years. Uh, there was a lot of right of way acquisition, a lot of permitting, federal, state and county permits were required as a complicated project. So I want to thank Marysville School District, Washtot, Snohomish County, and also a private landowner who granted the city a trail lease in order to build the trail. Everybody had a hand in this and we expect to start the construction here as we move into spring and complete it hopefully by the fall of 2021. And I want to thank another state grant that we got. I want to thank the state for uh, about one and a quarter million dollars in state funds that'll help to fund this program. So what about virtual programs? As we went through 2020, our parks, culture, and recreation department really adapted by providing many virtual activities. Some of these were online exercises, games and activities for families and children to do at home. One of the most visible and successful was really our 4th of July fireworks show. We were one of the few that took place in Western Washington. Most of those were canceled. We of course did it in a safe manner where we discouraged crowds from gathering, but we had areas where people could drive in and watch that and we also made it in a spot where it was really visible to a large number of Marysville residents to view either from their home or an area near their home and then also an opportunity to view virtually so it was an exciting thing we were happy to keep that fireworks show on even during uh, 2020. At the holiday season we uh, tried to bring some Christmas cheer to folks by holding our very popular Christmas lights contest and a self-guided tour map. I was also pleased to uh, ring in the Christmas season by celebrating the lighting of the water tower and the Christmas tree on 4th uh, Street there. 
uh, virtually and also got a nice visit from Santa Claus that hopefully you enjoyed if you were able to watch that. So we tried to bring some of that in and, and incorporate it in even though we weren't able to do all of the activities we usually do around that time. A real bright spot um, for the city in, in, in regards to recreation here in 2020 was Cedar Crest Golf Course. A real success story. Um, amazing numbers experienced at this city-owned golf course. Even after a 40-day closure through the state restrictions, total revenue in 2020 exceeded the record-setting year of 2019 by 22%. We finished 43% ahead of the 2018 numbers and 35% of, ahead of what was budgeted to bring in here for 2020. So we're really grateful for our partnership with Premier Golf, who's just done a fantastic job. And our golf pro, Shane Day, does an amazing job. I can't tell you how hard they worked and how difficult it was for them to pull this off in navigating the challenges uh, of all the state regulations and providing an excellent and safe recreational opportunity for people to get out and um, play golf uh, even in a, in a tough year like 2020. So as we start to wrap up, I wanted to touch on some of the other work through the administration here. Some of this might be somewhat less visible, but I want to start by talking a little more, as I promised earlier, about COVID and some specific responses to COVID. You know, I want to take a little bit of time to really speak to this and discuss the city of Marysville response that we had to this pandemic that's changed and really affected all of our lives throughout 2020 and now into 2021. Um, you know, we moved quickly with internal decisions in early to mid-March of 2020 to keep our workforce safe while also ensuring that we provided all of the essential services of your local government. There was not a workday that COVID did not impact something that we do. Uh, and I know it was the same for all of you as well. You experienced the same thing. I want you all to know that we have worked hard to adapt and to continue to provide a high level of government services to all our residents and businesses, despite the uh, complications of this past year. The decisions regarding uh, these COVID restrictions on businesses and individuals were made primarily at the state and federal level, as, as you probably know. These decisions override any local jurisdiction. We set out though from the beginning and we continue to this day to do all we can as your local city government to both keep our community safe while also helping those individuals and businesses who have suffered so greatly with economic losses through the most difficult of times. I also want you to know that I have personally advocated on your behalf and will continue to on a weekly basis with the Snohomish Health District officials, a uh, multitude of other officials, including state and federal. I've helped to lead efforts by elected leaders throughout Snohomish County to advocate for the needs that are specific to our communities here. Additionally, I've had the opportunity to speak through a variety of local and regional media outlets to make our case uh, for, for, for community needs. My focus in these and in many other efforts has always been on keeping our community safe while also advocating for our residents and businesses who have suffered so much economically due to the state enforced COVID shutdowns and restrictions. I am particularly concerned, I will say, and have advocated for our local small businesses and their employees. I have yet to see data that shows that our local small business community has inordinately contributed to the various spikes in cases that have occurred at different times throughout this pandemic, yet they are absolutely bearing the brunt of the economic burden of these shutdowns. There's no question about that. I trust and have personally witnessed how our local business owners have taken great care when allowed to be open to provide for the safety of both their employees and their customers. Um, therefore, I'll continue to push the governor's office and state officials to allow our small businesses to safely reopen while they still may have time to uh, salvage their businesses and salvage the livelihoods and the jobs of those that they employ. Uh, I also want you to know that your city council has been steadfast in this support as well, utilizing the various avenues available to them individually and as a governing body. They have also responded by approving a host of measures to aid our community through this difficult period, some of which we'll touch on here in just a moment uh, as, as I transition to sharing some of the, the nuts and bolts programs that we as uh, a city put in place to help our community through COVID-19. In 2020, the City Council approved and our finance department administered $1.79 million in business relief grants for local Marysville businesses. 
$81,901 in residential housing relief grants and $26,100 in utility assistance grants. These programs were to help businesses and individuals and families that had been negatively impacted through the COVID shutdowns. In addition, our community development department was able to administer uh, a lot of money through community development block grant funds that came to our city. Because of the size of our city, these came directly to us. So they administered $168,000 for low-income household rent and utility assistance. And then a special program for what's called micro-businesses. Those are really small businesses. They, were, they administered $242,000 for 19 of these small businesses in our community. These are businesses with five or fewer employees. So the other one, the $1.79 million, addressed a lot of um, a different level of, of, our, of our small business community, but this one kind of got at the micro-businesses. In total, if you add all that together, we were able to put $2.24 million in these grant funds out into the community to try and help us through this COVID shutdown. Of course, we all know that uh, the true recovery won't happen until things open up, but we were trying to get people through this time when they uh, were not able to be open or were very limited in the type of opening and, and revenue they could bring in. Emergency management is another area where we tried to help keep the community safe through the COVID pandemic. Our emergency management team did a remarkable job distributing over 70,000 face masks throughout the city. They delivered more than 500 getting to safe business kits. This was a partnership with the Marysville Tulalip Chamber of Commerce designed to give kits out to small businesses to give them the tools they needed to safely reopen. We also assisted the food bank with distribution over several weeks as they were inundated with uh, new clients throughout this pandemic. Our communications team did a remarkable job with regular website updates, social media, and e-newsletter updates about city operations and changes related to, to the COVID response, available resources for residents and businesses. We ran our Marysville Loves Local Small Business promotion to try and get people to support the small business community through this time. It also included a website map, particularly during the, the early to mid part of this, where you know, restaurants were adjusting and doing takeout and delivery options. We had a, an interactive map where you could find out where those folks were. Uh, I tried to personally also update the community regularly through uh, my social media pages. And I think communications are so critical in a crisis, even in areas where we don't control things. Uh, you know, we were able to update you on, on different uh, directives that were coming down, how the city was responding and how we might be able to help. So hopefully uh, those were helpful to you as a community. I wanted to talk a little bit about our growth management task force as we move kind of out of COVID and back into some of the business things. This growth management task force was designed to uh, take a look at kind of our ever growing and expanding community, particularly as we approach the 2024 comp plan amendment that is required uh, of the city through the Growth Management Act. So I formed this task force. It included city council members, planning commission members, city staff, and uh, five members uh, just chosen randomly from the community of of different walks of life. They uh, reviewed our existing growth planning framework, our downtown master plan, and uh, they also reviewed the development impact fees for transportation, for parks and other things, and just gave us some really needed and solid input as we begin to begin this plan update that I discussed. So appreciate those folks for, for working with us. The Cascade Industrial Center is another important thing in our community. This is the area out north, our jobs base. We had over 650,000 square feet of building permits issued there as this thing's starting to really take off now. Uh, the North Point Master Plan, which is nine buildings and over 4 million square uh, feet, uh, started and had one. Uh, we have one building in permit review. This will be an area where we can employ a lot of industrial uh, and manufacturing family wage jobs. Uh, other preliminary projects uh, were included more than 300,000 square feet of industrial buildings that uh, you'll hear more about as we continue to move forward. We're working uh, with our marketing team. Um, we have an agreement that was put together with the Port of Everett and the cities of Arlington and Marysville. Uh, also Economic Alliance in Hummish County is working with us very well. And with these partners, we're targeting uh, great marketing efforts to attract specific desirable industrial and manufacturing businesses that we want to bring here uh, that'll again add family wage jobs close to home for our, our residents. We're also asking lawmakers, this is one of Council and I's top priorities here for 2021, is uh, that they extend the property tax exemption that helps bring some of these family wage jobs here. 
and increase the, the wage rate for employers uh, that'll be eligible for that. So we make sure that they're the type of jobs that can support families in our community. Our diversity advisory committee, an update on that. Members of this have uh, kind of set about to tackle four key areas in addition to other things in 2021. One is community building and inclusion. The focus here is on the promotion of a citywide calendar tied to events uh, supported by this diversity advisory committee. Public safety, they've created a list of questions to ask both the police and fire chiefs to discuss how the city trains and their vision for accountability. Economic growth and prosperity, they want to help support and start engaging local businesses and figure out how the city can better support new business and help keep current businesses going and, and remaining resilient. And city practices create a, a shared commitment to equity with Tulalip Tribes, with the Marysville School District and the city. Well, we have great partnership between these three entities. We really want to highlight that and leverage that and you know, do trainings and things together to really show the, the community how committed we are in that area. So thank you to the work, the great work of the Diversity Advisory Committee. Quick update on our new public safety building, the Civic Center. It's been under construction for a full year now. You're probably watching that go up. Uh, I know it's fun to drive by. I enjoy driving by that and seeing the progress. We're still expecting uh, to stay on track for completion in the first quarter of 2022 and looking forward to that. Currently, some of the work you've seen is, uh, and the work that's underway is the slab completion as weather permits. Structural uh, steel erection is nearing completion. The steel framing of the exterior walls, the weather barrier work is continuing on the jail portion where the roofing is 95% complete now. Inside the jail, crews are finishing up cell wall construction, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. Interior work in both the police department section is taking place uh, later this month as well. As we move early, early into the spring, the site work will begin kind of along Delta Avenue there as they'll start to construct the plaza area and the frontage improvements. And by fall, you should have a visually solid sense of kind of the new skyline and what it'll look like. And then, uh, then we'll get to open it up in 2022. I do look forward to the time when we can reconvene in person and share that time together. Hopefully that's not too far down the road. Uh, I do appreciate you taking the time to view this state of the city and to listen. And I look forward now to the question and answer portion where just like we do at the live ones, take some of your questions here virtually and look forward to answering those. As always, if you need to get a hold of me for any reason, don't hesitate to reach out via email or phone call and happy to answer questions at any time as well. So thank you everybody. Uh, it's been a, been a difficult 2020. I'm so proud of our community. Our, uh, it's proven its resiliency over the years and did again in 2020. We have a wonderful community and it's my pleasure and a true honor to serve uh, as your mayor. And uh, thank you and look forward to the Q&A. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Mayor Nearing. And I'm going to go ahead and change the view here so that we can see everyone on screen in, quick, in case there are any questions. Um, we do have one in the chat already from Dom asking me how many of the hundred businesses are already signed up for the website. And I did want to let you guys know 20 are already signed up. So, and that's just from announcing last week. So we're really excited about that momentum. Um, I do see a hand raised by William Hogland. Is that uh, a question, William? No, it's up by accident. I, I hit the <laughs> I apologize. No worries. Paul. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Mayor Nearing. Uh, I just had a question about uh, the PPP dollars uh, business businesses receive. You know, I've heard some good things about, you know, some businesses, you know, being able to access these dollars. And I've also heard about some businesses having some difficulty in getting access. I'm just trying to get a sense of what you've heard and experienced. Yeah, that's a really good point, Paul. And particularly early on, uh, I know a lot of these federal grant, CARES grant dollars for paycheck protection went through the local community banks. And I know the first release, uh, it was gone almost immediately. Um, subsequent releases have been a little better. We worked really hard with our local business community to try and help them uh, fight through the, the bureaucracy on that. And I think it was what was really helpful is when it's at your local bank, you're not having to deal with some type of federal agency or something. But there's no doubt that particularly on that first run, it was really tough on a lot of businesses that, that just there wasn't enough money and they weren't able to access it. That's why we really pushed out um, a good chunk of our CARES money in that 1.79 million 
to our own CARES grants where we were given, you know, grants of up to 10,000 to local businesses. Um, and, and sometimes on multiple occasions, we were able to give grants to businesses. And the county did a really nice job as well, I should say. Many Marysville businesses got county, uh, Snohomish County CARES grant money as well. And so um, I want to thank the county for that. And, and surrounding cities did, did many of the same programs and did a really good job of that. So I think as local leaders, our goal was to um, help su supplement what was you know, available from the federal, at the federal level with some of the CARES grant dollars that we were given. And in some ways it was just easier to access. Um, really good question. And um, before I go on to, I just did want to thank Jessica and the Marysville Tulela Chamber for putting this on, even in a virtual, yeah. Great job, Jessica, making this available to people. I'm really appreciative of that. I want to thank Connie and Leah who did so much work to put this together here in my office. Thank my entire director team and my our CAO, Chief Administrative Officer, Gloria Hiroshima. This year would, would not have been possible without such a tremendous team of leaders uh, around, around me here and helping to lead this city. And uh, as well as all the employees all throughout the city, particularly those on the front lines who have dealt with COVID while they had to do their day-to-day -day jobs uh, out there. And they have just done phenomenal work. Um, and I want to thank all our partners. Uh, you know, you're not successful without partnerships. Uh, many of our partners are on this call surrounding mayors, and I want to thank them, uh, Cassie and John Kartak and Brett Gailey and, and Mayor Barb Tolbert. Just so many great partners uh, surrounding cities that that uh, help make Marysville what it is. Snohomish County, another great partner, state of Washington and the federal government as well. Those grant dollars you heard about, those are done through partnerships. So our elected officials at the state level, at the county level, our surrounding cities, we get together, support each other for these things that are important, both uh, in our individual cities and then regionally. And so I'm so grateful for that. Uh, I'm happy to take some other questions for as long as there's time. I've got, I've got plenty of time, so go ahead with if you have other questions. I don't know, Jessica will probably want to cut it off at some point. But go <laughs> ahead if you have questions. Uh, so it looks like Diane is next. She's got a good question. How can she, because she owns a, a drug and alcohol treatment facility and a clinical laboratory that does drug and alcohol testing. How can she hook up with the officer and counselor team for Marysville? Oh, yeah, great. If she could get um, her information maybe to you, Jessica, you get it to me, I will get it over to the embedded social worker team. We appreciate that offer very much. Thank you for that. Perfect. Uh, looks like uh, Jessica Shaw asked a question about, could you give an update on the progress about Marysville doing accessibility updates? Uh, ADA accessibility? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, we've got a very aggressive program to upgrade our uh, ADA accessibility. Uh, I talked a little bit about that. We were able to get a significant amount of grant dollars for that, and then we're using some of our transportation benefit district money uh, at the city level to, to match those grants. And so any of the new overlays that you see, we combine that with upgrading the surrounding uh, sidewalks to make them ADA accessible. And then we're also doing some other areas uh, as well for that. So it's a very good question. We have a lot of folks that traverse the city that need those kind of services. Actually part of our um, a committee for creating and sustaining uh, uh, opportunities for people with disabilities. I know that's a long name for a committee that we started a few years ago. That was one of the, the things that came out of that and some of our individuals who, who do uh, need that. And so appreciate you asking that question. And it's something we're committed to doing. It takes time. And it's a surprising amount of money it takes. You, you'd be surprised. I don't have a quote in front of me, but you'd be surprised how much it takes to upgrade an entire intersection for ADA accessible. So that's why we're really grateful that there are state grants and federal grants available for that. Thanks, Jeff. Fantastic. Uh, any other questions? Raise a hand or in the comments. Okay. Well, thank you guys for coming today. A big thank you to Mayor Nearing for your fabulous presentation, keeping us all up to date. Thank you. Um, I'll have the business, a digital business card swap out to you guys shortly. And then we'll see you again in February for our B2B, which is going to be our networking meeting. And the theme is moving forward together, springing forward in 2021. So goodbye now and hope to all see you soon.